Ooh, we're gonna talk about some spooky HELOC stories today, guys. So we're what tomorrow's is tomorrow Halloween, right? Tomorrow's Halloween. Oh my goodness, man, time is flying by real quick. So, guys, uh, this is the pre-show. Welcome, welcome, guys. We got hello from San Antonio. Oh, I'm sorry, I read that wrong. It's Antonio from San Diego. Wow, like look at my reading skills, right? I can I need to go back to uh, middle school there. Um, so welcome in Antonio, uh, all, all the way from San Diego. I'm sure you guys don't have snow there. We just got snow here in Chicagoland today, which is kind of weird. We usually don't get snow in October, but hey, anything goes in Chicago when, where it's a uh, windy city. So welcome in Antonio. Go ahead and comment down below. Where are you guys from? Share with us. Uh, we got San Diego. Uh, I know we got a lot from California and Florida at times. Uh, go ahead and share down below. We got some really spooky stuff here today. We're going to talk about dangers of HELOC, what you, could, you, what you could be doing to totally wreck your situation when it comes to using HELOC. Uh, we're also going to talk about what happened in 2008. I know I, I talked about it last week, but we're going to reprise that uh, and talk about that. So we got Al Carrillo saying, Sam, what's up, what's up, man? How's it going? Uh, go ahead and comment again. Comment down below. Where are you guys from? Uh, we got one more minute on the clock until we begin the show today. Super excited because I'm going to talk all about drama and crazy things you can do with a HELOC and uh, what you should not be doing with a HELOC, okay? We got Rally, North Carolina. What's going on, man? Uh, we got Gene from Miami, beautiful, beautiful Miami, where Miami doesn't participate in winter. They vote out of being uh, in the winter zone every year, so uh, welcome, welcome, Okay. Awesome, awesome. Come on in, come on in. Now, as you guys know, this is a Q&A show, so the more questions you guys ask, the better. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and talk about uh, spooky HELOC stories, what happened in 2008, and what we can potentially see if you don't use your HELOC the right way, and that's what we're going to talk about today. So, ladies and gentlemen, it is 11 o'clock. Let's go right into the show. Welcome to the Quack Brothers Q&A show. It is 11 o'clock on Wednesday morning, Central Time. I appreciate all of you guys watching this forever. Uh, for, you know, if you guys are watching this live, welcome in. If you guys are watching the recording, welcome back to the show. So let's talk about uh, what we're about to see, or let's go and first talk about 2008 because we have to set the stage as to what happened in 2008. Why did so many people lose their homes and their HELOCs, their HELOCs being shut down and locked? What's, you know, and, and crazy things that have happened. But first, we have to talk about our sponsor, and that is PropStream. PropStream is an awesome, awesome software. If you're into real estate investing as I am, and if your third wife is real estate investing, which means that you're that obsessed with real estate investing, well, PropStream is probably a must thing in your business. So if you're like me and Daniel, and you're always looking for real estate deals that are hot, 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 well, you want to get PropStream because PropStream is going to help you guys find these rare off-market opportunities where you can buy properties, you can negotiate them for owner financing. Uh, also, PropStream can help you trace, skip trace who the owner is on a property that you're looking at, as well as uh, give you that tool to be able to send postcards to your homeowners or your sellers so that you can go and start that conversation. Uh, PropStream can also help you guys estimate the repairs that you have to do on a property to be profitable. So get PropStream today, guys. My listeners get seven days of free trial of PropStream. All you have to do, all you have to do is go to reisoftware.thequackbrothers.com. Again, that's reisoftware.thequackbrothers.com. Get your seven-day free trial. Try it out. Give it a try. If you don't like it, you know, you can cancel it. Don't have to worry about it. You can come back and tell me how PropStream sucked. Okay, but I love PropStream. Daniel and I use PropStream every single day to go look for our deals and for our opportunities. Okay, so 2008, uh, what happened, right? Actually, what happened in 2008 wasn't 2008. It, it was actually more of a buildup of what we've seen in 2004 through 2007. So what was happening, and, and uh, I'll do my best to kind of, kind of capture and make this super easy for you guys without any crazy lingos, right? Uh, I hate talking about lingos too. I want to keep this simple and fun and, and uh, exciting, right? It's hard to talk about uh, recession and, and uh, finance without, be, uh, you know, with just boring lingo, right? We want to talk about it in a way it's fun and, and excites everybody. So back in 2004 to 2008, this was really the pinnacle of where the recession was building up to. Some may even argue that the recession really started, um, or the, the root of it all, started in 2000 uh, or 2001 when, of course, we had the dot-com bubble burst and 
Uh, everyone's like, oh my gosh, we, should, we, we need to stop investing into these digital companies. And they all start looking into where? Real estate, right? They're like, oh my gosh, dot com, useless, never want to invest in dot coms again, never want to invest in uh, online companies. This was a big fail. I'm going to go invest in something real. And of course, they invested in real estate. Now, here comes the problem when it comes to the real estate and everyone getting into it was this fact. Banks back at, 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 the, uh, at that time were super, super lenient as to what type of loans they were giving out and the way that they were giving out to the consumers. So traditionally, uh, most individuals back in the day had to do a 20% down, which is true even today. And uh, obviously, 80% of that, 80% of the home value, the appraised value, will be carried through financing. Okay. Now, the issue was the banks were super lenient in a way that how you come up with the 20% down. So banks were obviously saying, okay, here's your 80% uh, uh, of the home value. Here's the loan. Um, oh, what's that? You can't get the 20% uh, to come up with for the down payment? Don't worry. I got your back. We're going to go ahead and also finance that 20% down for you. And effectively, 100% of your home is being financed through a bank, which obviously you guys know where this is going. So... On top of that, most people didn't even qualify for, for some of these mortgages to our standard or to the standard today, which um, today you got to obviously have a good credit score, you have to have income, you have to turn your tax returns, you got so many disclosures thrown in front of you and you have to be notified of certain, certain things. But back in the day, you, know, you could literally walk into a bank and say, hey, listen, Mr. Banker or Mrs. Banker, I make $100,000 a year. Wink, wink, right? And then they'll they'll get they'll wink back right at you and say, "Oh, really? You make hundred thousand dollars?" Wink, wink. We'll give you a awesome subprime mortgage at you know six uh, percent interest rate, right? And they'll give you a free, essentially a free loan, right? But in reality, you only make twenty thousand dollars a year, which I'm not saying you do, but you know some people were making that much money going to the bank and saying, "I make hundred thousand dollars a year. Please give me money," right? So the, these individuals that don't have the business, didn't have the financial whereabout to go and buy a home, they were getting homes. And what's worse is that they were, you know, they were over leveraging themselves by getting not only 80% financing, but also their down payment was also financed. A lot of times that finance was, was through a home equity line of credit. So if this is the house, okay, lovely house, part of American dream, you get a mortgage, and the mortgage would cover 80% of the purchase. And what the banks would do is, you know what? If you can't make that down payment, we'll give you a HELOC at 20% to make sure that you can go and buy the home. We want you to get, you know, the banks were thinking, we want individuals to buy the home. Obviously, if you guys seen the movie Big Short or if you guys know what, what, you know, what happened in 2008, banks were taking these subprime mortgages and packaging them together to sell it on, uh, on the market. And they were calling us CDOs. And obviously, uh, banks were being very profitable with this. And they wanted more of this. They were like, oh my gosh, we're running out of subprime mortgages. We need to make more subprime mortgages happen. So obviously, they were going after people who are, quote unquote, the bottom feeder feeders. And no disrespect to these individuals. But literally, they were the bottom feeders of the the, uh, of fin the financial world. Right? They didn't have the money to ever buy the home. So, But the banks were still doing it anyway so that they can make money on CDOs. Okay, back to this topic of HELOC. So what ended up happening is, let's say this home value was $200,000 at the time, in 2004 or 2005, okay, 2005. But of course, when the market crashed, you know, Bears and, St Bears and Stairs and Lehman Brothers, they came collapsing, you know, the whole, pretty much the whole financial world just went upside down. That also being said, financing got harder, no banks were ever giving out loans at the time, demand dried up, and of course, when the demand dried up, that $200,000 went from $200,000 and dropped to like $150,000, right? I'm just being dramatic here, but uh, in some markets, it dropped even more. In certain markets, it didn't drop as much, but let's say now it's $150,000 in home value. But here's the problem. With your mortgage in a HELOC, you started out with 100% debt on that $200,000. So when come recession, when, when things get a little uh, hot and heavy, let's say, right? When things get desperate, Banks are looking to figure out, okay, we need to, we need to, we need to rethink this. Oh my gosh, we screwed up. So what ended up happening is two things. Number one, 
people were way over leveraged. Their home value was far below than what they were actually owed, right? So they still owe relatively around two hundred thousand dollars, but their home value is now one hundred fifty thousand. People are like, "Oh my gosh! Like this is not happening! Like this is crazy." Banks were saying, "Well, now you're in default because you you, you didn't keep it up to where it 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 uh, satisfied the LTV loan to value requirement." The second thing that was happening, the secondary effect of that was people were losing jobs. Uh, they're being let go, they're getting fired, and now they don't have the income to pay for both of these payments. It was just a, a domino effect one after another, and people were getting default. And this is when the banks went crazy and said, you know what, uh, we're in trouble, we're in panic, we gotta go close out the HELOC, no more HELOCs, okay? So they pretty much dropped a nuclear bomb, right, on all HELOCs, they're like, no more HELOCs for everybody. But, uh, I might be over-exaggerating here by saying everybody, not everybody had their HELOCs closed. And we have to remember that. Uh, people who were in trouble or the desperate banks were in that situation. And even if the HELOCs were closed, didn't mean that there were banks that were still giving out HELOCs at the time, though it was much harder to do so, right? So we need to remember what happened in 2008, um, simply because we don't want to make the same mistake. This is why here in the Quack Brothers, we highly, highly suggest, as our opinion, okay, this is not financial advice, our opinion is to keep the overall debt of your house below 70% of the market value, okay? So if the market value today of your home is $200,000, don't exceed more than 70%. Now, if you are already in the zone of you already exceeded 70%, you're like, oh my gosh, Sam, please don't tell me you're scaring me because, well, I'm, already, I'm at 90% or I'm at 80%. Well, this is why Daniel and I are dedicating all of our time and energy to help you guys pay off your debt as much as possible. This is why we have a video called How to Pay Off a Mortgage Within 5 to 7 Years so that we, could, we can get you guys at that 70% range as fast as possible, as early as possible, uh, if not you know, as soon as next year. So if you guys are at 80% or 90% LTV, you know, if you have that much debt, Use our strategy, guys, to go and pay, pay, that, pay that loan down as fast as possible. I know there, there were individuals that, uh, what was happening also, another spooky story, was going back to $200,000, okay, value, and, you know, this is your house. I'm going to draw that lovely house again. Here we go, okay? Let's say your value goes up from $200,000 and this was hap this is what was happening between 2005 and 2007. Like the home value was going up like crazy, and it wasn't going up because we there there are more uh, there are more population, which is what we typically see in a, a natural appreciation, right? There, if there are more people and you know more population growth, then we'll see natural appreciation because there's natural demand for more housing. People have to live somewhere. We can't just live underground or in caves, okay? Uh, you know, we're not some beast animals. We have to live in uh, in, in homes. So uh, where that's natural appreciation, phantom appreciation is what I like to call it, is when financing becomes easier, more and more people tend to get uh, interested in buying homes. They're like, oh my gosh, everyone around me is getting a financing. Everyone around me, you know, my cousin Vinny, my, my uncle Vinny is getting a loan. My, my cousin five-year-old is getting a loan. Uh, my teenager son is getting a loan. Well, I probably should get a loan too and get a, go buy a house, right? Everybody's, everybody was buying a house because... Some guy they heard said, oh, real estate is a great, great investment, so therefore I'm going to go buy it. But unfortunately, a lot of these individuals weren't educated, didn't know what they were doing, and financing was way easy. So there were more people that originally wasn't interested in buying a home, now are interested in buying a home. There's, there's more demand, there's more buyers in the market. So when there's more demand, when there's more buyers in the market, the of course, you know, if you guys understand uh, supply and demand, the value of asset tends to go up. And this is due to the fact that there's phantom appreciation, not natural appreciation, okay? So with that phantom appreciation, let's say it went up to $250,000 because there's a bidding war, right? There's more people making offers on a home, thus driving the value up. It's crazy, right? It's, it's insane. And what people were doing was they were getting uh, not only their original mortgage at 80% of the value, they already have a HELOC, Okay. And now they go back. I'm like, oh my gosh, we got $50,000 $50, more in value. We're more even rich. Let's go and get more equity. So what, what people were doing is like, you know what? Let's get a second mortgage because I want to buy a new car or I want to get a new boat or I want to get a, 
uh, I don't know. My, my daughter wants a, a unicorn, so I'm going to go buy my daughter a unicorn for $50,000, right? Whatever the case might be. And that was the mistake, guys. People were banking on phantom fake appreciation, okay? They weren't banking on real appreciation, which, by the way, I, I try not to touch my equity. I try to leave it as much as possible. But that's what people were doing back then. They were like, oh, my gosh, free money, free money. Like, they were taking it all in. And, of course, when the market tanked and dropped like a rock, uh, people couldn't make that payment anymore, right? They had three mortgage payments. They had a nice job, but that job is gone because economy sucks, and that was what's happening. So, guys, don't fall for this, for this trap. This is a spooky, spooky situation to be in, in the spirit of Halloween, right? This was happening, and I'm sure a lot of you guys went through this mess or you've at least heard of somebody that did this, and again, I mean, it's not to disrespect those individuals. I mean, we love them. We want to take care of them. But they weren't educated. They weren't prepared for what was going to happen. And I say this, and we have this YouTube channel so that we prepare you guys for crying out loud for what could happen next year or the next recession. Honestly, no one knows, right? No one knows when the recession is going to be here. But based on our predict prediction, recession is up, to, is up for a due. In fact, this morning I woke up to uh, uh, a Wall Street Journal breaking news that our economy uh, has now hit 1.7% growth, which is actually really, really slow. We, ideally, you want to be at 2% or higher, uh, but, but our economy this quarter, uh, last quarter, we, had, we were at 1.7% growth. Um, there's lots of signals. There's a lot of signs. There's a lot of uh, writing on the wall that indicates that we are headed for a recession. So, guys, I mean, we're at the last hour, son. I mean, th this is like the, the, the second before you know, the cry's second return. I mean, we got to, come on now, we got to prepare for this, right? So guys, uh, the best thing you can do right now, and I think a lot of the, a lot of the YouTube guys, uh, fellow finance channels out there are saying the same thing right now, is to pay down your debt as much as possible. Stay liquid. Okay, I don't think right, right now is the time to go and buy assets. Um, this is actually a conversation I had with Daniel yesterday. I, I think we shouldn't get too overly too excited to go and buy properties right now because I mean, if you look at what people are paying for, for real estate right now, I mean, it's absolutely ludicrous. I mean, it's way up the wazoo. So I don't think right now is the best time to go buy real estate or pretty much anything right now because right now the values are like right here, right? Like I'm, I'm going above the camera right here, um, but it could easily fall down back to here. And obviously this is where we want to buy our real estate. This is, that's where we want to buy, right? Buy, sell, or sell low, or I'm sorry, Buy low, sell high, right? That's what we want. So keep that in mind. Be prepared for what's, what's, what we may see and to protect your HELOC as much as possible. Again, going back to my 70% example, okay? Keep that balance below. Keep the overall debt, uh, overall debt on your home below 7%, okay? Less than 70%. Okay, I meant 70, 70 not 7, 70%. Okay, if you're at 7%, great. That's awesome because that's super low in debt. But below 70% is ideally where we want to be, okay? And that's combined in debt, right? That's mortgage and a HELOC. So stay within that zone. We don't want you to get hurt, okay? All right. Uh, morning, Sam from Seattle. What's up, Bobby Simpson? What's going on? Uh, Derek Edelmanson, dot bomb. Yeah, that was a dot bomb. Um, hi from Macon, Georgia, which I believe is very close to Atlanta, Okay. So, guys, uh, we have a lot of people today in the Q&A. I, I don't know what it is, but go ahead and comment down below what do you guys feel about 2008. What were you doing in the 2008 crash? How did it impact you? Were you hurt by it? Uh, or were you a survivor? Who knows, right? So go ahead and comment down below, as well as questions that you may have, uh, what, what to expect in the next recession in terms of using our HELOC. And I don't think not all HELOCs will be frozen again. Um, I think there's a, there's a good measure of protection for our consumers. Uh, we still have the C, uh, CFPB, Cons uh, Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. So we still have uh, some levels of measures and regulation in place to protect everybody. But you just don't know how the market can surprise you. So we want to make sure we do that. Okay. All right. How much equity you need to have on your property to do a HELOC to pay off your mortgage faster? Okay. So I'm going to answer that question. Ideally... Um, you want to have at least 10% equity on your home to do this strategy. Now, you can use a personal line of credit, a PLOC, okay? 
uh, you can use a personal line of credit to do this. Now, the advantage of the PLOC obviously is that it's not attached to your equity. So if the mar real estate market market would crash, um, your PLOC probably won't be affected. If Obviously, if the economy is that bad, they may uh, freeze your PLOC or they may make turn it into a, more of a personal loan type of situation. If you don't have equity, you can use PLOC to pay off your mortgage faster, take advantage of the fact that you can use double income utilization, lower the average daily balance, a lot of great things you can do with the PLOC. Uh, but obviously, like I was saying, most, um, most of the time you want to start at 10% equity, preferably obviously more would be better. Uh, if you're, let's say, at 30% equity, my recommendation is to use only maybe 10% of that or 20% of that to actually use towards our strategy, okay? Sherry Phillips is saying, survived but barely have to have cash and still recovering. Yeah, I know. It sucks. A lot of people really felt that that um, that hit, right? They hit the wall and they really haven't fi like fully recovered out of it, which really is, is the devastating effect of the recession is, if you know a lot of people who got hurt and they can't recover, that's where it gets painful. So uh, we're obviously you know the Quack Brothers here in our YouTube channel. We've dedicated our company to help people to not be in that situation anymore. Okay. Uh, if the house we are in has ten years left on the mortgage, should a HELOC be acquired to pay off mortgage quicker? Yeah. So you can use a HELOC to pay off even if you have ten years left on your mortgage. Uh, it can even drive down the interest. I mean, yeah, you're going to have very little interest to pay uh, because all that front-loaded interest is already paid off. But you can, it doesn't stop you guys from still saving you money on HELOC. Just because it only saves you a little bit of money on HELOC doesn't mean that you shouldn't, right? You should still take advantage of the money savings you get on that HELOC, okay? Uh, let's see here. Brian uh, Kittle is saying, I tried to get a HELOC, but the local credit union was going to use the county tax records to, uh, for the value of my home. Luckily, for tax reasons, th that is low, but hurts me getting a HELOC. Okay, and he follows up by saying, is that common? Yeah, so certain banks obviously have different metrics as far as how they appraise your home. Certain banks may actually use a professional appraiser to go in and fully evaluate in detail as to how much how much of your home is is worth, uh, some banks may use a BPO, which is broker uh, broker's price opinion. They're going to use a uh, real estate broker, a real estate agent, to determine what the value of the home is by using comparable, or sometimes it could be an income approach. Um, some banks may even do the comps or the the quote unquote online appraisal themselves. They'll go online. They'll look at how much your home is worth based on what other um, you know, homes in your area have been sold for. So there are different metrics that the banks will go. Um, the most common, obviously, is they're going to use an appraisal depending on how much of your home value you want to use in terms of getting a, a, a HELOC. So most common is appraisal. Second common, a BPO or, or a desk appraisal, which is going through the computer. We're going to see how much it's worth. Um, but in that category, they may use the tax record, the, the assessed value, as uh, the determining value. Uh, and again, it, it's all based on standards. It just depends on which banks that you go to. Okay. Um, so yeah, is that common? Yeah, it could be common. I've see, I see that a lot. Even here in Illinois, certain credit unions and local community banks will use uh, assessed value more so than um, comps or market value. Okay. Uh, Derek Ed Edelman saying, bought a second home, had $150,000 HELOC, Bank of America, froze. I lost, uh, I lost one home and had to file bankruptcy to keep my home. Yeah, I mean, it's super unfortunate. I, I'm sorry to hear that, that that's what happened. Uh, but that, that's, that's pretty typical. If you have over leveraged debt or if you max out your HELOC, that could happen. And obviously, we don't want, you want to want to be in that situation. Okay. Uh, do you have strategies to use a reverse mortgage? Um, actually, we have not. I know, I know what a reverse mortgage is, but we haven't really fully thought of paying off a reverse mortgage. Uh, but that's something that we'll work on, and we'll definitely incorporate that here in our YouTube channel. Uh, with that being said, if you guys have any ideas or if you, have, if you all have a common question to ask, we'll definitely turn that into a YouTube video. So if you have uh, an idea or, or any topic that you want us to cover, definitely do ask. Uh, we are going to actually start a video series 
on how to uh, improve your credit, how to increase your credit score. So we're going to have several videos in a series uh, on solely dedicated to credit uh, and credit alone. Okay. Um, all righty. Next question we have is uh, Bobby Simpson is asking, I have two rentals, one in 2006 and one in 2007. Didn't know what I was doing and the banks were handing out loans, almost no questions asked. Also got a HELOC for renovation. I survived it though. We. <laughs> yeah, some people, uh, we, su we survive it. Okay. Brian Kittle is from King County, Illinois. Well, that's where I live. So awesome. It definitely, we, need to, we definitely need to connect. But yeah, again, certain banks will use assess value more so than, uh, more so than the market value. And that might be effective in terms of, in terms of a market that's that's based on phantom appreciation, and I do see certain degree of phantom appreciation right now in our given economic cycle. So I can see the reasoning there. Uh, the banks don't want to repeat that mistake of using phantom appreciation to assess the value of the home. Uh, so yeah, I can see the reasoning as far as why they use an assessed value because an assessed value, it's static. It doesn't necessarily always rely on what the market is doing, okay? So that's good, that's awesome. Uh, and I'm glad that you mentioned that, okay? All right, so before we move on to the next, or if, while you guys go and type in your question, we wanna hear from one of our sponsors. Actually, that's us. So if you guys are wondering, how do we start buying properties without ever having the banks involved? Like we don't really want the banks to get involved in our purchases. A lot of times when the banks do get involved, it could be messy, it could be dicey. So if you don't want the banks getting involved or you simply don't have the credit to go start buying rental properties, well, fear not everybody. There's a concept called owner financing and we are offering a free course on it. So what is owner financing? Well. Owner financing is a concept where you negotiate an arrangement between you as the buyer of a home and the seller of the real estate. And basically what you're doing is you're making monthly payments to the seller. In exchange, the seller gives you the ownership right of the property, in which with that right, you can go and rent it out, you can go and create cash flow, you can create wealth, and later down the road, you can potentially refinance it uh, with the bank at a much lower loan to value. So if you, if you guys wanna learn how to do that, Go ahead and sign up for our free course, freeownerfinancingcourse.com. Again, that's freeownerfinancingcourse.com. It should be right this way. There we go, that way. Go ahead and definitely sign, sign up, or you can take a picture of it. I'll give you a couple seconds to take a picture of this or screenshot it. Definitely go and check it out. It's absolutely free, no strings attached. We're not gonna ask you for a credit card number. None of that is true. Go ahead and sign up right now for free. Okay, so we do have a couple more questions that I see here. Gene is saying, what bank would you recommend to do a HELOC? On your HELOC video, you say TIAA Bank, and Ron was speaking on behalf of that bank. So uh, for bank recommendation, for liability purposes, we no longer can offer bank names on our videos. There's a lot of hassles. Um, that was actually our mistake in our last video with, uh, with Ron Bork, is that uh, there's a lot, a lot of liability when it comes to mentioning specific institutions. Uh, now, that being said, TIAA Bank is no longer around. They were purchased by, I believe, U.S. Bank. So U.S. Bank bought them out. Uh, the uh, TIAA Bank no longer exists. But um, because to reduce the liability, to sort of have that control experience, uh, we do have a list of suggested banks, uh, just purely our opinion, uh, that is part of our program to teach you guys how to pay off your debt faster using our strategy. If you guys want to learn more about that program, do go uh, email us and we'll give you more information about it. That's info at thequackbrothers.com. Again, that's info at thequackbrothers.com. So if you guys want to learn more about our course, it's right there. Okay. Um, so with the HELOC, uh, but what I, what I will tell you is this, I don't want to leave you hanging, Gene. So what I will tell you is that when you go and shop for your banks, uh, my opinion has changed to where um, you want to go and shop with your local credit unions or a local community bank, not one of those like nationwide or national chain like U.S. Bank or PNC, Chase. Some of those HELOCs tend to be not the best. Uh, I mean, still good, but not the best. Uh, a lot of times your credit union or your local bank tends to actually have a better term and better flexibility and, and benefits when it comes to your HELOC. So for example, I'm with Navy Federal Credit Union. Uh, I do have a military background, so I do have access to an awesome credit union. So by the way, if you guys uh, are in military or if you guys have been part of a military or if your family member or friend is in, mil is in military, 
Um, I believe both Penn Fed and Navy Federal are options that are open to you, which I, I love uh, either of those two credit unions. They're pretty darn good. So I would definitely check them out. But uh, in terms of, um, you know, with the HELOC, I would actually go with the local credit union uh, and community bank. Um, from there, you want to make sure that when they offer the HELOC, Make sure that, that your access to the HELOC is super easy in a way you can use like an app, right? You can go and use an app to uh, transfer money back and forth between your HELOC and your checking account. Uh, it's also helpful that if you can go and make direct deposits into the HELOC and do direct deposit deposits or ACH transactions out of the HELOC, it makes things a little easier to, you, to do the strategy, okay? Alrighty, uh, we got... Marta Garcia that's asking, I have $20,000 cash. Can I pay my home principal or my HELOC? So this is actually a video that I just did today. We're going to release it in, some, in a couple weeks. Uh, but before, you, excuse me, before I went live for this, for what we're doing right now, um, our video team here filmed a video called, should I uh, use a HELOC to pay off our mortgage or should I just do extra payment? And here's a little preview. I'm not going to give you everything because I do want you guys to subscribe to our YouTube channel and wait for the real thing to come out. But when you, if you do have that much of cash available, what I would do is use the HELOC to pay a, 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 do a principal payment against your mortgage and then take your $20,000 cash that you have. And by the way, real quick, I just want to backtrack. I am not a financial advisor, so I'm not telling you what to do with your money. I'm not giving you financial advice. This is strictly my opinion as an educated real estate investor as well as an entrepreneur, and I'm just telling you what I would do. So what I would do is take that $20,000 cash and do a principal payment against the HELOC. Now, the reason why we do that is with the HELOC, we can still access that $20,000 cash at a later date. So what if you run into an emergency, right? What if you need to uh, pay for an emergency situation? Well, we don't want that $20,000 to go directly into a mortgage where we pretty much lose access. We no longer have the access of that $20,000. It's locked up, right, into the equity. Uh, but when you use a HELOC, we can always use that money back out towards real and dire emergencies that we have. We absolutely have to use the $20,000. Now, of course, another question that people may ask is, well, Sam, why not just take that $20,000, put it into an investment or a savings account where it's going to earn us maybe 1% one or, one or 2%. Well, the problem is it's only earning you 1% to 2% when you can take that $20,000, reduce the average daily balance on your, on your HELOC, which now saves you anywhere between 4 to 7% on interest. So where you would have owed uh, 4 to 7% interest on the $20,000, now you're saving that much money because you're putting that $20,000 into the home equity line of credit. While the money is parked there, right, while the money is sitting in your HELOC, it's saving you money. And you can access that money in the future date when you absolutely, absolutely need to use it, okay? All right, great, yeah, great questions, guys. Love uh, what you guys are asking. I feel like you're, you, you, the, the questions that you guys are asking each and every episode is getting smarter, which tells me that you guys are learning, which you guys are turning into an expert of your own, which I'm really proud of you guys. So uh, thanks for asking all these amazing questions that you guys have to ask. Cool? All righty, guys. Cool, cool, cool. So uh, go and drop, drop down more questions and just kind of give you guys, um, I guess, a preview of what's coming up here in the Quack Brothers. Uh, we are releasing new content all about HELOCs. Uh, should I do an extra payment on the HELOC? Or should I do an extra payment on my mortgage versus HELOC? Um, what are some of the ways um, to use a HELOC to pay off your mortgage? We're also going to talk about, we're going to have a, a whole entire series on credit and how to improve credit. Um, so we're going to talk about that. So if credit is what's stopping you guys from, uh, getting a mortgage, uh, this is, a, or, or I'm sorry, getting a HELOC, we're going to talk about how to improve your credit so that you guys can qualify for a HELOC and, uh, you'll learn some permanent ways to keep your credit scores, uh, relatively high and healthy. Okay. So, uh, all right. Yeah. So that's, that's pretty much what I got for you guys as far as spooky, spooky stories. I mean, obviously I'll keep on thinking about, uh, spooky stories, um, but let's let's move forward to uh, uh, the future, right? Like what what could happen in in a recession to your HELOC? Well, I mean, the worst case scenario obviously is a repeat of what we've seen in two thousand eight, where obviously people are going to lose their HELOCs, people are going to lose, uh, or they're going to freeze it. Um, if the banks are at least nice to you, 
What could happen is they'll let you uh, modify it into a closed-ended mortgage, which basically means that they'll freeze it and they'll turn it into another mortgage, basically. Uh, but that doesn't stop you guys from going out there to sort of get a new HELOC from a different bank that may have a looser restriction. So if one bank says, sorry, we're going to lock up your HELOC, it's frozen now, well, that doesn't mean that you're, you lost all hopes or opportunities to get another HELOC. You can always go and get another HELOC from a different bank that, again, has a different criteria and different underwriting uh, uh, rubric, and they may just qualify you for a HELOC. It may be a different amount or interest rate, but it still keeps you afloat and still gives you that flexibility and access to the HELOC when and if you need it, okay? Uh, we got Paul J that says, hello from New York City. Awesome, welcome, welcome, man, all the way from East Coast. All right, phenomenal. So, so guys, I appreciate all of you guys jumping on board. We got Jade Caster uh, asking a question. I have to deposit in checking that I go online and transfer to to HELOC because both accounts are with the same bank. Yeah, you could do it that way. That that's perfectly fine. In fact, that's what a lot of people do anyways using, using the strategy. Um, obviously, the better alternative is to have your money go directly into the HELOC. Um, and, and then still, it's still connected to your checking account where you need to draw it out into the checking account. You still can, can do that. So you can do that. Uh, Gene Cadet is saying, I owe $255,000 on my property and my house is worth $330,000. I went to my credit union and do a HELOC. Do they offer me $1,000? Okay, so I went to my credit union to do a HELOC and they offered me $1,000 for my HELOC. Do you think I have enough equity on my house? So let's go and break that down. You have $255,000 uh, that's already there. That's on a mortgage, I'm assuming. Okay. $255,000 and your home is worth $330,000. Okay. So we have to first determine the LTV, which I'm going to do that right now. I'm going to actually bust out a calculator. There we go. Open the wrong thing there. There we go. All right, so we're going to go 255,000. Okay, you guys see, see my calculator, right? Mm -hmm. Thousand divided by 330,000 is 77% LTV, which is not that bad. It's, it's pretty typical. So you're at 77% LTV, okay? And chances are uh, your bank offered you... I believe either an 80% LTV. So let's see what that looks like. So I'm gonna pull out my calculator again. Okay, 80% minus 255,000. So chances are they, what they may offer you was 9,000. So here, here's what might be the issue. Uh, and I'll, I'll do a follow-up question here for you, Jane. Did the bank tell you that your home value is three hundred thirty thousand dollars, or did you determine that yourself? Is the question because if that's not what the home value is, in according to what the banks have come up with, then yeah, I can see why they offered you a one percent home equity line of credit based on eighty percent loan to value. So at eighty percent loan to value on the thirty three hundred thirty thousand uh, dollars of home value, yeah, you're gonna get about nine thousand dollars of a limit in terms of your HELOC, okay? So that's a follow-up question that I have is, Gene, did the banks tell you that your home value is $330,000 or did you come up with that yourself? If the bank has offered you a $1,000 line of credit on an 80% loan to value, sounds like they may have valued it slightly less than, uh, than $330,000. Um, there are HELOCs that, that give you 90% loan to value, which obviously you're going to go into a higher degree of risk. Uh, banks are going to ask you for more of a, a documentation of other assets you may have, liabilities, life insurance, retirement accounts, uh, whatever the case might be. Obviously, 80% um, is pretty typical. Um, check with your credit unions or other shop around because Another thing you guys have to remember is that not all HELOCs are created equal, okay? Uh, HELOCs are non-QM, meaning they're non-qualifying mortgages. Banks can have a little bit more customization as, to, as far as what they can and cannot do. Um, they can offer you different types of features depending on which banks you go to. So, uh, yeah, so bank says 321000 Okay, there it is. So the bank says 
321,000, and that's what we typically go with. So I'm going to erase this out, okay? I'm going to use my pen again. So if your value is $321,000, according to the banks, okay, let's do the LTV again. Pull on my calculator. $255,000 divided by 321 is about 79% LTV, okay? So it sounds like um, if you did 20% down on your initial mortgage, uh, you might have, this might be a fairly new mortgage, okay? On 80% loan to va value, we're gonna go and do, let's see, 321,000 divided by, or times 8%, you get, yeah, so there it is, $256,000. Minus two hundred fifty-five thousand. Yep, eighteen hundred bucks. So I, we can see we can sort of trace back to how how the banks calculated uh, the thousand dollar limit that you get, uh, which is relatively low, right? I'm not gonna lie. Um, so, but at least we know how the banks are calculating uh, the the line limit uh, based on eighty percent loan to value. So again, there are banks that offer 90% loan to value. This Again, this is where we enter the danger zone. I don't really like anything that goes above 80% loan to value, but um, this is where you might actually be better off getting a PLOC, a personal line of credit, than a HELOC. Um, the interest rates might be slightly higher, but if you guys know my mantra, interest rates really don't matter in, within the context of this strategy. Okay, that's, that's the mantra for our videos. Interest rates really don't matter within the context of our strategy. So you might actually go and you might have a better luck getting a personal line of credit than a business uh, or a, a HELOC. That's something that you, you should probably look into is a personal line of, of credit. Okay. Well, cool, guys. This is this is good. We got some real life case studies. Okay. Uh, we got Lou from Connecticut. Welcome back, Lou. I know who you are now because I've seen you multiple times. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Cool. Okay. I see all your guys' questions, which is good. So guys, um, if you guys don't have any uh, questions from now on, from this point, we're gonna, we're gonna actually end this sh show short. Um, we're gonna try to keep the shows uh, actually 30 to 40 minutes to answer as much as questions as possible. Uh, this is mainly so that, uh, not because, you know, we, we, you know, this is a waste of time, but we wanna make ourselves um, less, not less available, but we wanna make sure that um, there's, a, there's a science behind uh, these types of shows where if there's actually less of it, there's more demand. So we want to create this this perception of scarcity that there's less of the show, therefore our show becomes a bit more valuable. So we're going to play with that idea of doing more of a 30 to 40 minute Q&A rather than a full hour Q&A. Um, so that's something, that, that's something that's in the book. We're going to try it out. Um, obviously, if it doesn't work, then we're going to go back to a full hour Q&A. Uh, I'm going to answer one more question from Brian. Have you done... Uh, have you ever done owner financing for the purpose of a short-term rental as opposed to traditional rental? Are there unique things to consider with doing so? Mortgage acceleration could be awesome. Yeah, I mean, it's nothing really changes as far as the front-end operation of your uh, short-term rental. If you're talking about Airbnb or VRBO, really, when you do an owner financing with a seller, whatever you do with the real estate is up to you, unless there's other restrictions set by the agreement. So whatever you do with the real estate, Totally up to you. I'm pretty sure your seller won't care uh, if you're making money using uh, Airbnb or VRBO or some of these other vacation rental type of, uh, of things. Uh, whereas, and the, the, the other side of the coin, or the second part of the question is, if you're gonna use uh, accelerated banking to pay off your owner financing, do let the seller know. A lot of times, what the seller is expecting is, uh, the seller is expecting to make money on the interest Right? They're expecting to make money on um, the fact that you're going to go and stay, you know, 20 year amortization or 30 year amortization to make that money. But obviously, if you're paying that mortgage early, you're sort of taking away that opportunity for the seller to, to make money with that interest. So obviously, that might not be the best combination um, in terms of, um, you know, allowing the seller to enjoy the interest payments that you're making in exchange that you don't have to use the banks. Okay. Uh, one more question from Derek Edelman. Uh, after getting HELOC, does it make sense to use credit card to make mortgage payments? Um, no. Uh, I, I, I don't know. So backtrack. You, you won't be able to use a credit card to make mortgage payments. That's a, that's a fact uh, of its own. You still have to use a checking account when it comes to the mortgage payment unless your HELOC allows you to do a, a direct ACH out of, 
uh, the HELOC account to a mortgage account. That could be possible. So um, yeah, so that's something you could do. Again, some banks offer this option. Some banks don't. Um, so keep that in mind. Okay. All right. Uh, awesome. Marta says, you're the best. Thank you. I love you from Madison, Wisconsin. Well, I love you too, Marta. I appreciate you being on board. And of course, I love all of you guys and appreciate all of you guys for watching our show. Uh, it, it, it truly means a lot for you guys to subscribe and uh, click like on this video. When you click like, every like goes into a, uh, a meal for those starving kids. Now, I'm not going to say that, but uh, as a joke, right? I'm not, as, as, that's just a joke. But, uh, but every like that you press on this YouTube video, which is absolutely free, it's not going to cost you any money. You're not, you know, you're not going to lose your soul if you click uh, like bu the like button. But what it does help us with is the YouTube algorithm that, uh, that could help us get this video out to as many people as possible. We can get our channel in front of... Uh, every people, every person that needs our help. So it, it helps us a lot when you click on that like button and subscribe to our YouTube channel for more videos on HELOC, on credit, on finance, on real estate. We got lots to come. We're so excited uh, to where to, to see where the, the Quack Brothers YouTube channel is going to go. So guys, appreciate all of you guys being on board. I'll see you guys next Monday. Have a great ho uh, Halloween and be safe. Don't go out there trick-or-treating alone. Have a buddy. Uh, don't get kidnapped because I don't want to pay for, uh, um, you know, kidnapper rescue uh, thing, okay? I, that's not what I want. I love you that much, so don't get kidnapped. Uh, you, you don't, you, you don't want uh, to get into, get into that situation. So guys, thank you so much. Love you all. I'll see you guys next week.